Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Restore live stream. Uh, it may be a little while since you've seen me on the live stream, uh, mainly because it's been a little while since I've done the live stream. Uh, but if you've been missing me, then uh, hey, I'm back. If you haven't been missing me, then um, I'm still back, and uh, I guess you'll have to uh, get over that. Um, now, the good news is, hopefully the good news, is um, you're going to be having me for the next four weeks, um, and actually I'll probably be doing more of the live stream during the autumn than I have done over the last season. There's a number of reasons for that. One is I've been traveling a bit more over the last season. Um, the other thing is I've done a lot of the uh, material preparation for the autumn, and so it makes sense for me to deliver it on the live stream. So it is good to be back. Uh, we are back in uh, September now, and uh, as you know, in terms of the, the year, really, I think there's lot, two moments where the year kind of feels like it kicks off with fresh momentum. Uh, one of those is in January, the start of the calendar year. The other of those moments is in September, the start of the academic year. And after the summer, uh, we finally did get some sunshine, didn't we? Um, after the summer um, and an opportunity hopefully for us to be able to rest a little bit. In September we like to uh, lean back into our vision and uh, make sure that we have a focus and a purpose as we step into the next season as Restore. Uh, that uh, feels uh, particularly important for this uh, coming September. Um, so this September we're going to use each week to be uh, part of what we've called a vision series. So looking at some of the key components of what who God has called us to be as Restore and the vision that God has given us for Restore. So on each of these next four weeks, we're going to be looking at different aspects of that vision and culminating the last weekend uh, with uh, Restore's 40th birthday party. If you haven't uh, picked up on it, uh, Restore is 40 this year. Restore began um, really um, because the Holy Spirit uh, brought us into being uh, back in 1984. And uh, I, I think the first two couples who began Restore had no idea what God was going to do over the next 40 years. And it's been amazing to see how many lives have been touched, probably thousands of people's uh, lives uh, in London um, and in the vicinity, the immediate vicinity of Restore, but also a lot wider through the uh, lives and ministries of uh, different people who've uh, passed through the doors of Restore. So last weekend in September, we're going to have a big celebration weekend and we're going to say thank you to God for the last 40 years, but also we're going to look uh, forward to the next 40 and beyond in terms of fulfilling, uh, fulfilling God's purposes for our lives. And so it feels more important than ever that we lean back into who God's called us to be as Restore. Um, another thing to keep your eye on for uh, this uh, month is from the 16th to the 23rd, we've got a week of prayer and fasting. Now, again, we do that normally in January and in September. Uh, we're going to do it this month as much as uh, we ever do. So from uh, uh, the 16th to the 23rd, of uh, September, we're having a week of prayer and fasting, and that's a week to get our uh, lives aligned to Jesus's uh, uh, vision for us. And so it's an opportunity to make more room to uh, pray and to spend in the presence of God. And we also uh, lay aside some stuff to be able to do that. Obviously, the key uh, fasting that we see in the Bible is people stopping eating. Uh, and so I'd encourage you to be asking God, is there something I can do in terms of fasting, either cutting out some sort of food uh, for the for the whole week, maybe cut out food together all together for the whole week. Who knows? Uh, maybe there's an item of fooding, a, a food you can fooding, a food you can cut out for the week. Uh, maybe there's a meal you can regularly cut out, um, or maybe there's some other fasts that you want to do as well, whether that's uh, Netflix or social media or uh, something like that. But a good question to ask is: if I was going to put my life back on track in terms of uh, living for Jesus, what would be a good way that I could do that in our week of prayer and fasting? So that's the 16th to the 23rd, and then the last weekend in September is our Restore 40th uh, birthday celebrations. So as I said, over the next four weeks, we're going to look at different aspects of the Restore vision. Um, hopefully you know the Restore vision comes from Isaiah chapter 61 and uh, verse 4, which says, they will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They'll renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. And the whole 
tenor of that verse really is that we as God's people are anointed by his spirit to bring three hours actually to, uh, to rebuild, to, re, uh, to restore and to renew. And uh, we as God's people want to be all about that process of seeing restoration in our own lives, uh, but seeing restoration in the world around us, uh, rebuilding uh, the community uh, that God wants us to be a part of uh, locally and, uh, and to bring a sense of renewal in into every community that we engage with, whether it's a workplace community, whether it's a residential community when we live, wherever that is, we want to be God's hands and feet to bring restoration. And uh, Isaiah 61 is a very important bit of scripture, uh, in, actually, in the whole of the Bible, because in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus is beginning at the very start of his public ministry, uh, he goes to a, a synagogue on a Sunday morning and he quotes from uh, Isaiah 61. And in many ways, uh, a lot of commentators will say this is Jesus declaring his kind of manifesto, uh, so declaring everything that he's going to be about that we then see fulfilled through the next three years of his life. And uh, when he does that, he, uh, he reads the first two verses from Isaiah 61. He says this, Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 19, says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I love those verses. In many ways, they're kind of um, the uh, uh, key verses for my life. Uh, they're everything I love about Jesus kind of contained in those verses. And they're very precious verses to me personally, but also for us as Restore. And over the next four weeks, we're going to take different aspects of uh, Luke uh, 4, 18 to 19, and talk about them. We're also going to link them with different uh, prophetic words, different words that God has spoken over Restore over these last 40 years. Because as I say, every church is, has, a, has, a, has, has a reason for being. And uh, Restore, there's a reason why Restore exists. And so we want to lean back into some of the key things that God has spoken to us over the years and remind ourselves of them as we position ourselves uh, ready to step into the next 40 years, uh, the work of the next generation for uh, Restore. So today we're going to look uh, at the first bit of uh, Luke chapter 4 verse 18 where Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is on me. The spirit of the Lord is on me. And what Jesus was saying right at the beginning of his, his uh, ministry was he was saying, God is at work through me. And so what's going to happen is not just my good ideas. It's not just good, my good words. It's not just my belief and convictions. But actually, God is at work in me to birth something. And uh, the reality of being part of the body of Christ, the reality of being uh, uh, the church that Jesus has commissioned to continue his work is we need to know and experience the life of God in our midst. And we need to know that personally, but we also need to know that sense of the Holy Spirit is wanting to bring something to birth through me. And in the life of Restore, that's been something that's always been very important to us, that we're constantly seeking to be filled with the power of God's Spirit. And we're constantly uh, alert to hear what God's Spirit is saying to us so we can align ourselves to that. One of the things I think many people would say over the life of Restore is there's been lots of changes over the last 40 years. And... Uh, Maybe in lots of ways that isn't surprising because God has never called us to be static. God is always wanting to be on the move. He's always wanting to do something new. And if we're aligned to the purposes of God, we will always be changing. We will always be moving forward. There will always be a sense of shifting because we're seeking to cooperate with God and follow the journey that he has for us, the calling that he has for us, the destiny he has for us. And if we look at the early chapters of Luke, because obviously Luke 4 is in the context of what comes before it, we find that the early chapters of Luke are all full of the Holy Spirit uh, working as God prepares to birth something through the life of Jesus. And there's four things we can see happening in the early chapters of Luke in terms of the Holy Spirit being at work, leading us up to this point of Luke chapter 4 verse 18. And those four things is, firstly, God speaks by his Spirit to, to declare what is going to happen. 
God speaks by his spirit to declare what is going to happen. And uh, uh, there's an um, older priest called Zechariah, and uh, he uh, goes to the temple to minister. And uh, the angel of the Lord, which many people uh, will say is God himself, the angel of the Lord appears to him and speaks to him and says he's going to have a son. And that son is going to be who we know to be John the Baptist. And it says in Luke chapter 1, verse 15, it says, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. And uh, John the Baptist was a, was a prophet, and a prophet is somebody who speaks what God is going to do. In uh, Amos chapter 3 uh, in the Old Testament, uh, it says that uh, God doesn't do anything without he first reveals it to his prophets. And there was a sense at the beginning of Luke chapter 1. Um, and, and we know the immediate hi historical period before that, God had been silent for 400 years. There's no recording part of the Bible from the end of Malachi to Luke, but there's an intervening period of 400 years of silence. But because God was about to do something new through Jesus, there was a prophetic stirring, a prophetic announcing, and God was speaking, something new is going to happen. So the first thing the Holy Spirit does is the Holy Spirit speaks what is coming. And there's a sense of, oh, we're entering into a new season because God is beginning to do something new. Secondly, so, that, so if number one is the Holy Spirit speaks, secondly, the Holy Spirit initiates. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, we hear that John the Baptist is coming. John the Baptist is coming to herald, to prepare a way for Jesus, to declare that God is birthing something new. That process of birthing happens in uh, John chapter 1, verse 35, when the uh, angel Gabriel appears to Mary. And uh, the words of the angel to Mary are, the Holy Spirit will come on you, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. The Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And Mary conceives because God's Spirit rests on her. And when God is wanting to bring something to birth, that birthing happens because we welcome the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So if God has spoken something to you, and remember Luke chapter 1 begins with God prophesying, God speaking something that's going to happen, the second step is to welcome the work of the Holy Spirit to then initiate, to start to birth that, to start to form that within you. And Mary's response to the word of the angel is, let it be done to me according to your word. In other words, God, I'm cooperating with you. God, let your Holy Spirit overshadow me. God, let your spirit start to bring to birth in me this new thing that you're wanting to do. And literally, that was conceiving a baby that she was going to carry. Um, and one of my favorite bits from Luke chapter one, actually, is uh, Mary then uh, goes to visit Elizabeth, who's Zechariah's wife, who is pregnant with John the Baptist, as Mary is pregnant with Jesus. And you get the encounter between the two women and between the two babies. And in Luke 1, 41, it says, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. It's the first instance in the New Testament of someone being filled with the Holy Spirit. But as Mary brings Jesus into the room where Elizabeth is, and John the Baptist is, then the greeting, the sound of Jesus coming close causes Elizabeth and John the Baptist to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And whenever Jesus comes close, we should have an expectancy that God is going to birth something new in our lives. And so in, in uh, Luke, we st see uh, the first step, the Holy Spirit speaks, a new thing is going to happen. Secondly, the Holy Spirit comes upon Mary and starts to birth that new thing. The third thing is we see the Holy Spirit then uh, filling Jesus as a preparation to what he's going to do through Jesus. And uh, when we get on to uh, Luke chapter 3, we get the story of the baptism of Jesus. And uh, John the Baptist, obviously, he has the name the Baptist because he baptized people and he called them to repentance. Repentance means to turn your life around, to get rid of everything that isn't good. Baptism is a picture of that because you, in effect, have a public washing. Uh, you stand uh, in some water, you go under it, all the... Uh, yucky stuff is washed away from you and then you come up a new creation a new being united with God but in Luke chapter 3 verses 21 to 22 says when all the people were being baptized Jesus was baptized too and as he was praying heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in a bodily form like a dove a voice came from heaven you are my son whom I love with you I'm well pleased 
And so we've seen that an, an angel announced prophetically by the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, Jesus was coming. We saw Jesus begin to be born in the womb of Mary through the Holy Spirit coming upon him. Now Jesus is an adult uh, just before he steps into ministry. He gets baptized in the Jordan. As he gets baptized in the Jordan, he has an experience in the Holy Spirit where the Holy Spirit comes and rests on him like a dove and the Holy Spirit empowers him with God's presence and God speaks over him. You are my son in whom I'm well pleased. And it's by the work of the Holy Spirit, we know that we are loved by God. We know that we're a son and a daughter of God. And we know that we have an identity of belonging to our heavenly father. And today, if you're watching this and uh, you would say you're a follower of Jesus, the Holy Spirit wants to remind you and encourage you with the fact you belong in the family of God. God's love wants to rest on you uh, like that dove came and rested on Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. God's love wants to rest on you and say you're dearly loved. You're my beloved, you're a beloved son, you're a beloved daughter. And, uh, and God's spirit wants to come and fill you with the goodness of God. And you see, the whole point about uh, uh, our relationship with God is it's a relationship, it's a friendship. And just as friends rub off on one another, as we spend time in the presence of God, as we invite his spirit to come, then so that presence of God will rub off on us. Uh, so uh, what we then do in other moments in our life, there'll be the outflowing of the work of the spirit of God in us because just as Jesus was drenched in the Jordan as he got baptized so he was drenched in the spirit of God and if we're going to fulfill the things that God wants us to do in our lives we need to take those moments encourage those moments where we can get drenched in the spirit of God so when you read your Bible don't just read your Bible for an intellectual uh, reason uh, re uh, though it is good obviously to have a, a good understanding intellectually of the Bible um, but read the Bible that you might encounter God so when you read the Lord is my shepherd say Holy Spirit help me to experience what it is like to be a sheep with a shepherd show me what it's like to experience you as my good shepherd and when we experience those kind of things then we have a, a, an encounter with God that starts to uh, and equip us for all the things that God wants to do through us. So we get drenched in the power of God's spirit. For me, I, I've said many times, but I, when I get up in the morning, start to pray, I'll put worship on and play in the background. And sometimes I'll sing along to it. Sometimes I'll just uh, rest in the presence of God. But I use those moments to drench myself in the spirit of God so that what comes then hopefully out of my life in the rest of, of, of my day is, is, the, is God's spirit at work because I've positioned myself in that place. So in the early chapters of Luke, we see, uh, we see God speaking by his spirit. We see God beginning to birth something by his spirit. We see God growing and developing and filling Jesus by the power of his spirit. Then Jesus goes into the wilderness. Uh, and again, you've maybe heard me speak about this a number of times, but in Luke chapter four, verse one, it says he goes into a time of pressure and trials. He goes in full of the spirit. And in verse 15, when he comes out it says he's moving in the power of the spirit and the Greek word used there is dunamis from which we get dynamite and it's actually as Jesus goes through a period of testing and as he prays and fasts God does something in him that takes him from being just full of the spirit to then moving in the power of the spirit one of my prayers for this month is that together as we seek God's face together as we pray together as we fast we might move as God's people from just being filled with the presence of God to actually moving in the power of God and seeing the miraculous flow through our lives and we'll talk a bit more about that next week but we want to move more and more as God's people in the power of God and there's potential to do that as God squeezes us and we hold fast to him through those periods of squeezing that actually God can form something in our lives out of that and when Jesus comes back out of the wilderness it says uh, he came out uh, moving in the power of the spirit it's then that he goes to the synagogue and uh, in the synagogue in Luke chapter 4 verse 18 it's then he says the spirit of the Lord is on me he has anointed me 
And everything that Jesus did be, was he was able to do because he knew God's spirit on him and he knew God's spirit anointing him. Now, the word anointing is used a lot in the Old Testament. And when somebody was commissioned to be a king or a priest to lead God's people, they would go through a process that they would publicly anoint them, which means they'd get some oil and they would put it on their uh, forehead and when they, or they'd pour it on their head. And when they put it on their forehead or Put it on their, um, poured it on their head, it was a sign of recognising God had set them apart for a purpose. And the oil represented the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus steps forward and says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, God has anointed me, what he's saying is he's saying I'm the new leader of God's people. And uh, God has equipped me. God has prepared me. God has uh, got me ready for this point. And uh, now I'm publicly saying, I am anointed as the, the king of kings. I am anointed as the great high priest. I've an, I, I am anointed to lead this new season in what God is doing. And I love the fact that the Greek word that's used for on me, where it says uh, the spirit of the Lord is on me. The word that's used there is to put something on something that fits perfectly. And so it's like Jesus is saying, God's spirit fits perfectly on me. God's spirit is on me because this is what I was created for. And God is with me to see this happen. And as God's people, as restore, if we're going to fulfill everything that God's called us to, we need to know God's spirit at work in our lives. We need to intentionally be making room for more of God's spirit in our lives. And we need to know this is what I am here for. So when we read Isaiah 61, or when we read Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 19, we're able to say, as followers of Jesus, as people who want to live a life like Jesus, God's spirit is on me. He's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He's anointed me to bring freedom for the prisoners. He's anointed me to bring recovery of sight to the blind. He's anointed me to set the oppressed free. He's anointed me to announce the year of the Lord's favour. And he has, and that's not me being presumptuous it's not me being proud it's simply me saying that as I've surrendered my life to Jesus so God's spirit is on me in the same way that God's spirit was wanting to work and was working through the life of Jesus so God is wanting to work through me to continue the life and the ministry of Jesus because that's what it means to be the body of Christ we go the way that the head leads us we follow in the places that the head is at work so we should expect that the spirit of God would be on us and our lives would be good news to the poor. We would be part of a church that sees the um, uh, prisoners set free, that see people in bondage to addiction or debt or whatever else people are in bondage to these days. We see it broken in Jesus' name. We see the sick being healed. We announce the goodness of God to everyone. And uh, we're going to be able to uh, see that happen through our lives if we are intentional about being filled with the Spirit of God. And there was a word that God gave us in the early days of becoming restore that was really, really significant for me. And a number of people bought it, uh, it <coughs> at different times. But we went through a season. It was spoken a number of times over us and was one of the key things that I think we need to keep remembering and uh, leaning back into in this season. And that word was that restore, we are called to be a sailing ship, not a rowing boat that we're called to be a sailing ship and not a rowing boat. Now, what does that mean? Well, for me, it had a particularly resonance, resonance to it because uh, when I was at university, um, I actually went to uh, Cambridge University and you know, uh, Oxford and Cambridge, big part of university life there is rowing. Um, and so I know quite a lot about rowing boats. I know particularly a lot about rowing boats because one of my friends uh, had, uh, at his secondary school, had, uh, uh, was at a public school and uh, had been part of the rowing club and, and was a cox. And so when he got to university, um, they were really keen on our college and signing him up and getting him coxing the boat. And he agreed to do that. And then uh, he was doing a law degree under the pressure of work and things. He bailed from doing that. And they said, well, you can get off the hook in terms of being a cox if you can find a good replacement for yourself. Um, and so he came to me and he said, Ian, you're quite light. Um, do you want to have a go at coxing a boat? And uh, I'm normally up for a challenge. So um, I said, yeah, OK, I'll give it a go. 
Now, one thing you need to know about uh, Cambridge is the River Cam um, is uh, the main river in Cambridge, but it has three 90 degrees bends, one after another. So any rowing course will have three literally 90 degree turns, uh, one after another consecutively. And they row, um, they have what's called bumps rowing, which is, is madness. Um, but each boat starts 90 foot away from the one in front of it, and then you'll have one behind you, 90 foot behind you. They start 18 boats off at the same time, a cannon blasts. In one of your station, the cox holds a, a, a chain that keeps you uh, in, your, uh, in your right place. Uh, when the uh, cannon goes off, all 18 boats set off at the same time. And uh, the aim is to physically hit the boat in front of you. They call it bumps rowing, so you're meant to bump the boat in front of you. And if you hit the boat in front of you, you both have to go to the start, and the next day you swap pay, uh, places, and over four days, the idea is you need to aim to get four bumps and go at four places over the course of those days. And obviously you need to bump the boat in front of you before the boat behind you gets to you. Now, because there's three 90 degrees turns consecutively, your ability to steer a tight course as a cox can make all the difference. So my friend uh, got me a go in a boat. I decided to give it a go. Um, so I gave it a go. And one of the things they found very quickly is I was really good at steering a boat. Um, and so I quickly became an in-demand uh, cox. And uh, we had many uh, great experiences in terms of bumping other boats, um, which was great. Um, but it also means I learned a lot about rowing. And one of the key things I learned about rowing is, is number one, all the energy comes from the people within the boat. So the pace of the boat is determined solely by human effort, and that's by the people within the boat. The second thing I learned is a good rowing boat has everyone who's rowing, rowing in complete unison and perfect timing. And so everyone in the boat, all eight of you, have to do the same thing at exactly the same time. And that gets maximum uh, momentum in the boat and keeps the boat perfectly balanced. And so in a rowing boat, it's all about our effort. And our effort is achieved by everyone doing the same thing. Now, God spoke to us and said, I'm not, I've not called you to be that kind of church. And that was good news to me. Because we want to be a church that's not just about our effort and our work. Yes, I want to give my best to Jesus. Yes, I do try and uh, work hard for him and give my very best for him. But actually, I want to see God at work through me and through us, not just my own efforts. And my own efforts will never be that good and will never give a great result. But the work of God always will be. And the other thing that I love about uh, that whole picture is that I believe every one of us is uniquely made. And uh, we're all unique uh, in that we're different from one another. We've got different abilities. And so we never want to be that kind of church that produces clones of one another, that everyone is the same as, as each other. I, 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 I think it's fine to be inspired by your heroes. And to some extent, you do pick up some of the traits of your heroes as you grow through that process of being inspired by them. But we never want to be producing clones. We never want to be a typical restore person looks like this. And if we were a rowing boat, we'd be putting all of our human effort into cloning one another and making this ideal restore person. And God said, that's not the kind of church you are. You are called to be a sailing ship and not a rowing boat. Now, as I said, I know quite a lot about rowing because I had a lot of experience about it. As we're reflecting on that, a group of us in the leadership thought, why don't we book ourselves a day's rowing, a sailing experience? So we experience what it's like sailing. And so we did. We went down to Southampton and went sailing for a day. Um, and it was great. And I learned quite a lot in a day about sailing. I'm not a great sailor, but I learned some things about it. Number one, I learned a sailing ship has to spend its time watching the direction of the wind. And if we're going to be effective in the spirit of God, we've got to spend time discerning, God, where are you at work? The, another word for the Holy Spirit is the breath of God or the wind of God. So we've got to be sensing, Holy Spirit, what direction are you leading us in? Holy Spirit, what are you speaking in this season? Holy Spirit, what is it that you're about in this season? So then we can cooperate with what God is about and where God is leading us. And then when you uh, understand the direction of the wind, then the way you set your sails and all the action you take is all about harnessing the power of the wind. 
And for us as a church, we simply want to uh, cooperate with what the Holy Spirit is doing so that can propel us on the course that God has for us. And the other thing I learned on a sailing ship, well, I learned another two things. Number one, the uh, <coughs> first of those was actually it, it is really hard work as well. When the wind is blowing, everyone has a job to do and they're working really hard at it. So it's not that it's easier than rowing a boat, but it is that it's, it's more effective because the work that you're doing is to harness the power of the wind, the spirit of God, to see God birth something. But the thing is, every one of us on the boat had a different role to play to get the sail in the right position or to steer the boat to be able to get where we needed to be. And uh, I love that fact that we were all unique and able to express our variety, but cooperating together under the leading of the wind, the spirit of God, in order to get where God wanted to take us. And as I look back through the last 40 years, there's a number of things we never would have done if God hadn't initiated them. So we've often had a five-year plan as a church. I think planning... Uh, I think there's a lot of wisdom in planning. I think God works often through planning. Uh, God gave Moses a plan for the uh, temple, the tabernacle before he built it. And, uh, and God is into forward planning. But we've always said we plan in pencil because we take the best perspective on what we think God is going to do. But actually, in the outworking of it, often it's different. And we need to be willing to shift our perspective according to how the Holy Spirit leads us. Give a simple example of that, but uh, I'm here standing in Restore Woodford. A few years ago, I got a call. Uh, we were just being given the Oakwood Hill Community Centre in Loughton. I got a call from Church Growth Trust, and uh, the guy said to me, Ian, will you come and look at a building in Woodford? And uh, I'd been really stretched. We'd been busy as Restore. Uh, someone had said to me recently, a number of people had said to me recently, we can't take on anything more in this next season because we're already fully stretched. And uh, I'd taken that on board, so I was uh, trying intentionally to be cautious. And this guy rang and said, Ian, will you come and look at this building at Woodford? And I said to him, um, thank you for the offer, but no, um, we're uh, fully stretched at the moment. We're not interested in anything else. And then the guy said to me, he said, no, Ian, you need to come and look at this building in Woodford. And so I said, no, <laughs> um, we're fully stretched. We're not going to be able to take on something new. And he said, well, when I was praying, I felt like God said, restore, need to come and see this building. So I thought, OK, we need to be led by the Spirit of God. So let's not close something down straight away. Um, so I said, OK, and I gave way. I said, OK, I'll come and see the building. We arranged the time for the next week. Then I went to see a member of our team, uh, Stuart Hassard, and I said, Stuart, come with me to see this building in Woodford. And I said, but you know that I like new things. You know that I'm, um, I always like something fresh to get my teeth stuck into. Your role is to come with me and make sure I say no to it. And I invited Stuart on that purpose. I reminded him of that as we went on the journey there. We came to see this building, pulled up outside, doesn't look very impressive, thought this is going to be easy to say no, I'm just going to be polite for the next hour, then I'm going to walk away from it. We walked in the doors, saw the first bit and thought, yeah, this is okay. Walked into the hall, saw that, and thought, yeah, this is okay. Went, saw the uh, uh, rooms downstairs, and uh, it became more like a TARDIS. And as we went on, there was like, oh, Oh, and there's this, and oh, and there's this. I started to think, hmm, this is more interesting than we thought. And then I came up and uh, we met the group of people who were the remnants of the congregation that was meeting here. And they said, are you interested in, in uh, taking this over? And I said, um, it's a great building, I can see the potential, but probably no. And they said, why not? And I said, well, one, we've got a lot of things on. But I said, two, this is going to be complicated. And they said, how is it going to be complicated? I said, because if we take over, we're going to want to change things, going to do things a different way. And you say you want a new day, you say you want to be part of something new. But honestly, trust me, you'll get upset about the changes we want to make, if we want to redecorate it, do all those sort of things. And the guy looked at me and he said, Ian, can I stop you there? And I said, OK. And he said, um, God's told us we need to give it to you, lock, stock and barrel. So we're going to close as a church. We're all going to go to different places and you can do whatever you want to with the building. Blank piece of paper. And I stood there and thought, oh. And so I did what any wise leader does. I played for time and said, OK, give me a bit of time to pray about it and we'll come back to you. I then went outside with Stuart and I said to Stuart, what do you think? And Stuart said, we need to say yes to that, don't we? 
And I was like, I gave you one job, and look. Um, but he was right. And we sensed the Holy Spirit was saying, I've got this for you for the next season. And actually, as we invited other people into it, they felt the same thing. And so we had our plan for how things might be, but God had a different plan. It's been amazing to see how God's rebirthed a church here. It's amazing to see what God's doing in the community around side. Uh, it, it's amazing to see how God is creating a new day and a new season. But it's because the Holy Spirit initiated and birthed something. As a church, if we're going to be effective in everything that God has for us, we need to keep that mentality of which way is the wind of the Spirit blowing? What do I need to do to help harness the wind of that spirit? Uh, may I be fully surrendered to the work of the spirit? Because then as a church, as Restore, we can know God's spirit is on me. God has anointed us and we will be good news for the communities that we're a part of and for the world around us. But it all starts by being people that are surrendered, yielded and empowered and led by the power of God's Spirit. So as we enter into this month of vision and celebration, let's make it in, in, an, an intention of this month that we will lean in, that we will make space, that we will make room for the work of God's Spirit so God is able to birth in us what he wants to birth. Let's pray and then I'll let you go and enjoy the rest of your Sunday or whenever you're watching this. Lord, thank you that... Uh, it was just so exciting to me to read the early uh, chapters of Luke and see how you were birthing something new in this season. And Lord, I'm so grateful for the last 40 years and all that you've done through the life of what was Vineyard Church, what is now Restore. And uh, Lord, over this month, Lord, we want to have a month that we can um, look back with gratitude for all the ways you've worked uh, in and through our lives. But Lord, also, we want to be ready for the new that you're wanting to birth. And Lord, thank you that you have called us to be a sailing ship and not a rowing boat. And Lord, in this season, Lord, I just want to take my hands off the oars. And I want to lay them down. And Father, I want what happens in this next season not to be the product of my effort. But I want it to be the work of the Spirit birthing something new through me. So in these moments and over the course of this month, I lay down some stuff intentionally so I can receive afresh from your spirit, so I can tune in to what your spirit is speaking, so I can make those moments to be filled with your spirit, and so I can know your spirit empowering me and anointing me to be part of the good news that you want us to be in the world around us. So breathe on us afresh, breath of God, just where you are, you want to, maybe you want to invite the Holy Spirit to come. Maybe you just want to close your eyes, reach out your hands, maybe put your hand on your heart, take some deep breaths and welcome the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I believe in this season you are wanting to bring us into a fresh day of bringing new things into being. And so, Lord, I pray that you will kindle or rekindle dreams or words from the past. Pray that you will lead afresh by your Spirit. And we pray, Father, that we might know the breath of God resting on us and empowering us and leading us for this new day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining with us today. As I say, from uh, next Sunday or a week on Monday, we're gonna be starting our uh, week of prayer and fasting. Why not use this week as a preparation to that? And then let's get ready to use that week, 16th to the 23rd, particularly as a week to reach out in the Spirit of God, surrender again to the Spirit of God, and to ask God to speak to us. Bless you. Thanks for joining this week and uh, I'll look forward to speaking to you again next week.